Customer notes. Please have more power for my V6 Mustang. Well, today's project, neighbor brought over her 19, no, 2001 or 2002 Ford Mustang with a 3.8 liter V6. I did the brakes on this one. I did it on one side because it was metal to metal and I didn't have time to do them both. I did the driver front. I need to do the driver, and excuse me, the passenger front. I need to do the driver front, put those pads back on. And while I was working on it, I heard a slow to start, slow to crank kind of, there. it was cranking, but it seemed like it was taking too long. And then a couple weeks went by uh, she called me up, battery was dead, put a new battery in it. And that day when she went to go start it back up, I could hear it was just taking an excessively long time to start. So after engine spins over for about two, you know, one second, two seconds, it should start. Nyin, 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 should start. This one was sitting there doing that for like about eight to 10 seconds. So I'm gonna do some preliminary checks real quick. I'm gonna show you guys how I do that. The very first thing is even if the check engine light's not on, I always run codes just to see if there's stored pending codes or anything like that. So let's get the old scan tool hooked up and raise some codes. So I'm gonna use this Autel Max Pro MP808. If you guys don't remember that one, I'll put a card up in the, uh, this side I think, uh, up in a corner here, you click on that card and you go over to watch this video for this one, but we're gonna open it up. Diagnostics, and we'll go to Ford. Okay, and you see some of the, um, the gym module has some faults, the hybrid electric instrument cluster, I'm not worried about any of that. We're just going to go over here, check out the old ECM, read the codes, key on engine off, blah, 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 blah. Need to put the park brake on. We have a camshaft position sensor and the air conditioning is on. Okay, uh, they already know about the camshaft position sensor. I'm not real worried about it if they're not worried about it. So there is a camshaft position sensor code, and if it is faulty, that can cause a, um, a long crank condition. I have a feeling it's something else. I don't know why, but I wanna start this thing up, but I'm gonna go ahead and pull up some live data before I do that. Watch some of the numbers and see what they look like. Specifically, I wanna see the cam signal. Now, scan tools are notoriously buggy when it comes to watching your cam signal on here because the data rate is just so terrible between the computer and the scan tools. Um, I don't know if that's a scan tool fault or a manufacturer fault because I don't think manufacturers are really going to bother to put in a lot of processing power into the diagnostic port for people to hook up to. So it does have a camshaft position sensor fault. I looked at the signal and from the data I'm looking at on the scan tool, looks like it's looks good it's not dropping off or anything so i'm not that worried about it i want to check fuel pressure real quick um manually just to see what that is because my gut's telling me when i first heard it and it was kind of a cooler morning that the fuel pump was it just sounded wrong because it sounded like it was extended cranking and then kind of started kind of started and then got a little bit more and it, to me it sounds like fuel pressure kind of revving up like it's cavitating real bad you know maybe it's like a strainer in a tank or fuel filter or the actual pump itself so we'll find out so checking fuel pressure, it's actually pretty easy on a Ford. Some vehicles it's a little harder because they don't give you provision to hook your test gauge up to it. Um, we call those little um, service port or Schrader valves. It kind of looks like a valve core that you put in, like, on your tire when you put air in your tire. Looks just like that, so that's what you're looking for. On a Mustang, on the V6s, they're over here. Most of your test ports are gonna be on the fuel rail somewhere. Uh, some of them will be in this little connection pipe. I forget what vehicle that is. I think it's a Chevy. But pull your cap off. It helps to have the engine as hot as possible. You pull this little cap off and you have to, you're have you going to have to use a fuel pressure test gauge or kit. This is just a standard thread size on these so you can go to any of your parts stores. Whatever they have on the shelf is probably good enough for most of your applications. Even the cheap ones on the counter that I've always used in a pinch have worked pretty good. There's some gimmicky ones, you know, if they have a vacuum gauge built into the pressure gauge for fuel, don't get that one. Uh, those are a joke. Get one that's specifically for fuel pressure and only fuel pressure. Hook it up, 
For a vehicle like this, a fuel injected vehicle, your standard pressure is about 45 PSI to 60 PSI, somewhere around there. I use a Snap-on EEFI 500, for those of you that are curious, or I think it's EEI, AEFI, maybe it's one, I don't know. But the case is a joke. So I opted to get an ammo crate that I got at, I think Academy Sports or something like that, to put it in there because this thing actually seals, it seals all the freaking gas fumes that this thing has because man, I can't stand all those fumes. And I put all my attachments in these, this little Plano box. That way they're all nice and organized. So this is the, the adapter we're after. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit so you can see how this thing actually fits on there. Usually start it just by doing it like that by hand. Once it's on there, a couple of threads. Get it tight. Then use your fingers to tighten it on down. Don't have to be He-Man tight or anything. There's a little valve core in here, so you don't have to worry about when you hook it up to the gauges. Let's pull your little collar back. Fit it in there like that. And there you go. Now this clear tube that comes with it is a little pressure relief because once you supply pressure to this gauge, there's no way to bleed the pressure without taking it apart and it's kind of dangerous. So all this is for is to help drain the pressure when you go to uh, disconnect and help bleed the air out of this hose and everything. Um, you could also use it to kind of volume test your fuel, uh, fuel, your fuel pump. Standard fuel pump should be able to keep a car running if you hold this button down. Should, it'll stumble a little bit, but it should run. It's kind of a redneck test, but you know, when you're in the field, you do what you gotta do. So I just turned the key on. With the key on, it'll turn on the fuel pump in the tank and supply pressure up here. And it should run for about 10 seconds, somewhere around there. And then the pressure should hold right there like that. It's holding good, 45. I'm gonna go ahead and start the car up. We're gonna watch what it's doing while it's running. Well, should have filmed it the first time I did this. Um, I checked this fuel pressure the other day, the day it was actually doing the prolonged start and was barely getting 35 maybe and it had to really climb to get there. Um, today it's fine. Might be a sporadic fuel pump problem, maybe a relay problem. I don't know. I'll figure out which relay this is, see if I can't swap it with a known good relay. Um, and when I do that, what I'm talking about is like you take one out of the, let's say the relay for the AC compressor clutch is the same as the fuel pump. A lot of times it is. You swap those two. If you start having problems, intermittent problems with your air conditioning, well, you know your relay is intermittently giving you issues. So a lot of times if I don't have brand new relays on the shelf, I'll just swap it with another one and then road test it and see what we got. It's holding pressure, it looks fine. So I'm just gonna hit my button, bleed the pressure off. Then undo your coupler and remove your end. Well, fuel pressure test is fine today. I'm gonna go ahead and lift it up and look at the fuel filter. Maybe somebody actually wrote the mileage down on it. Probably go ahead and swap it out and um, kind of look underneath the car and see its general condition. See if there's anything maybe in the wiring there back, back there by the tank. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time um, diagnosing this, trying to duplicate the problem. We can lift her up, look under her skirt a little bit. So I'll show you guys underneath the car. Now this was, this was a northern car. Uh, most of its life, Pennsylvania, from what I was told. And surprisingly, not really that much rust underneath here. There's some things, you know, the exhaust is rusted. The drive shaft has got a nice patina to it and the axle is rusted, but... Not as much rust as you would think. So the reason we're back here, because we gotta change that fuel filter. And to do that, I just use these little plastic deals. The only problem with these is uh, I only ever use the green one, I think, or the red one. 
and I just lose the rest of them, including the one that I need. So this is like the fifth set that I bought. So the first thing we got to do is we got to take that little retaining clip off, use a little flat blade screwdriver. And to use this little tool, all you got to do is clip it on that line like that. You force it into the hole and that's it. Now be careful, don't stand underneath it because it's going to drain fuel. And now that the lines are disconnected, there's a little hose clamp that hopefully comes loose. To, uh, to put the new one back in, it's really, really easy. The only thing you need to know is that these have metal lines, so they don't, they don't use the clips that are supplied with the fuel filter. But if yours has the plastic insert clips, I highly recommend that you replace them. These are those little clips that come with the um, new filter, and what they do is the plastic lines go down on top of here. These plastic clips go into that plastic line like that and keeps the um, line from coming back out. I like the metal spring retention clips like this. They seem to work better. And just a, a tip, you guys saw how easy those came out. The reason they came out that easy is because I sprayed them with some of the CRC knocker loose. Stuff works really, really good. I sprayed it down, uh, sprayed all the connections, sprayed that hose clamp, went to the store, got that little plastic tool, came back and it just came apart like a breeze. If you'll spray everything down, even if it's not a rust belt car, spray it down with some lube, um, it'll solve a lot of issues. Trust me, right honey? And to put these clips back on, all you gotta do is just press the hose right back on. So when you do a fuel filter like that, Make sure before you start the car, you turn the key on and let it run for five or six seconds. That way the fuel pump can prime the fuel system and you won't run the fuel system out of fuel. Come out here to show you guys. This is a fuel filter. I don't know if you can quite tell the color of this stuff coming out, but... It's not supposed to be mud. If that wasn't the issue, I guarantee he's gonna make a vast improvement because uh, that's some dirtiness. I might cut that apart and see what's going on inside. And there you go. So now we can fold that apart. See the color difference between the two? I'm not quite sure if that picks up on camera or not. But it is definitely coated in some kind of filth. But it might have been on there for a really long time too. But she got a new one now. So that is that for the fuel problem for now. 
I'm going to give it back to him and say, try it, let's try that. If the symptoms come back, then we could drop the tank and replace the strainer in the tank. I don't have the transmission fuel tank jack for a vehicle off the, um, on a lift. And I don't want to go buy one right now and I don't want to do it on my back either. Um, I really think that that fuel filter with all that nasty crap coming out of it, um, it's going to increase, it's going to help out a lot. Uh, we'll just try it from there. Now I need to put the pads on the driver front tire real quick. I'm not going to film all of that, I don't think. And uh, check all the fluid levels. Well, I got the rear brakes done. I didn't film it because it's just a brake job, standard brake job. I did want to show you guys, this is the fuel pressure gauge I was telling you about. Um, there's different versions of this one. This one happens to be packaged by Bosch. I doubt Bosch actually makes it. Looks like this, really cheap. Every auto parts store has some setup like this. And this one actually comes, um, it had the adapter, because it's got that large one. It came with the one correct for a Ford. Um, but if you just need to diagnose your own vehicle, this is perfect, this is fine. There's no reason to get the $500 kit. I got this Snap-on kit. Um, because I traded for it, and I actually forgot what I traded for. I think I traded a, a gun or something like that that I had for it uh, to another mechanic and ended up with it. But I test fuel pressure and a lot of different things, so I need all the adapters for it. Snap-on actually makes a pretty decent kit, but it's expensive. It's like 600 bucks. So I bumped these headlights out. They look much better. I'll put a side-by-side -side picture here in the video so you can see. I didn't show how I did it and why or the process or anything because there's a whole bunch of videos on YouTube and it seems like every time anybody does this to a vehicle, there's always some body guy that wants to tell them they did it wrong, they used their own compound, they used the blah, 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 blah. All I did was I bought this little 3M kit. This one just for the pads. Comes with this pad and this black polishing pad. Use some Meguiar's rubbing compound. Or actually I used some 1500 grit wet sandpaper, sanding them down, then rubbing compound, then finished it with a couple of coats of wax. I don't have any glaze on hand, so that is what it is. Both of these headlights are not very good. This one has the entire back end of it is just all busted. The front of this car was wrecked at one time and they just put that headlight back on and that one. Both of them need to be replaced. They've got cracks in the back of them. There's plastic missing. So I didn't really want to put a whole lot of time and effort into um, shining them up and making them look good because they need to be replaced. But they're much better than they are and I didn't charge a customer for that. I checked all the fluid levels and everything. Everything looks fine on a car. Or everything's good to go. All my work is did. All I got to do is start it up, drive it off the lift, do a little test drive, and jump start my stupid service truck because the battery's dead again. Um, there's a parasitic draw somewhere in that truck that I need to figure out for the last like two years. <laughs> I still haven't done it. If you guys notice, I did change shirt. This is my uh, get out and fix something shirt. That's what the back of it looks like. In the front of it. I print my own shirts, hats. Um, we got coffee cups and stickers. There's a link down in the description to the Shopify account. You get over there, you can buy the shirt. All the proceeds go to the channel. Like I, I actually have the shirts printed. This is not Teespring and these are good quality shirts. The ones you get on Teespring, at least the ones I had uh, designed and ordered uh, they lasted about three months and then the prints completely like cracked and, and just went away. I think this shirt's probably nine months old so far. It's holding up really well. I spent the premium on getting them all silk screened. So if you like that, the hats or anything, like I said, get down the description, go over there, hit that. If you do buy one of the shirts or the hats or the coffee cups or the stickers, get on Instagram and tag me on Instagram at Stephen Cox YouTube, uh, hashtag get out and fix something. Anytime you guys have a shirt or a hat or a sticker, I really want to see you guys. Um, you don't have to have yourself in the picture. You can just stick my hat next to the project that you're working on, but I'd like to see you guys, um, uh, you know, a little short video or something on Instagram. Just give a little shout out, see if we can create a whole get out and fix something army. Comments are still disabled, so get over to the Facebook link down in the description. The link to this video will be put up over there, and you can comment. If you guys do notice that you guys follow the channel and the Facebook page, I can't put the link to the video over on the Facebook page until the video is live and it's public. 
Um, if you guys don't know that, whenever I upload a video to YouTube, you can put it different, a couple of different ways. I can have a private link where only I can watch it. I can have an unlisted link where only the people with that link can watch it. And I have a public link where the video like you're watching now, everybody can see it. When I upload a video, I usually schedule to come out the next day or the next couple of days or that weekend or whatever at a certain time. I can't copy that link for the video and put it up over on Facebook until it's live on Saturday. And I usually don't wake up early on Saturdays, but my videos go public on Saturdays. So I wake up when I wake up, and then if I remember, I put the link over there. I promise I will put the link over there. So if you watch this video and the link's not over there, just give me like an hour or something like that. Hope you liked the video. Get out and fix something. Right, Ethan? Go!